uh, there's something called the efficient market theory, which says that there's nothing in the data, let's say price data, which will indicate anything about the future, because the price is sort of always right. The price is always right in some sense. But that's just not true. So there are anomalies in the data, even in the price history data. For one thing, uh, commodities especially used to trend, uh, not dramatically trend, but trend. So if you could get the trend right, you'd bet on the trend, and you'd make money more often than you wouldn't, whether it was going down or going up. That was an anomaly in the, in the data, but gradually we found more and more and more and more anomalies. None of them is so overwhelming that you're going to clean up on a particular anomaly, because if they were, other people would have seen them. So they have to be subtle things. And you put together uh, a collection of these subtle anomalies, and you begin to get something that will predict pretty well. How elaborate are these things? Because in my head, I'm imagining, you know, some equation like uh, like Pythagoras equation, and you put a few numbers in, and something spits out. But are these giant beasts of equations and algorithms, or are they are they simple things? Uh, it, well, the the system, as it is today, is, is extraordinarily elaborate. But it's not a whole lot of it, you know. It's it's what's called machine learning. So you find things that are predictive. You might guess, oh, such and such should be predictive, might be predictive, and you test it out in the computer, and maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't. You test it out on long-term historical data and uh, price data and other things. And then you add to the system this if it, if it works, and if it doesn't, you, you, you throw it out. So there aren't elaborate equations, at least not for the prediction part, but the prediction part is the only is not the only part. You have to know what your costs are when you trade. Uh, you're going to move the market when you trade. Now, the average person will make a buy 200 shares of something, and he's not going to move the market at all because it's too small. But if you want to buy 200,000 shares, you're going to push the price. How much are you going to push the price? How are you going to you know, are you going to push it uh, so far that you, you, <laughs> you can't make any money because you've distorted things so much? So you have to understand costs, and that's something that's, that's important. And then you have to understand how to minimize the volatility of the whole, of the whole assembly of positions that you have and, and be... Uh, uh, so you have to do that. That, that last part uh, takes some fairly sophisticated applied mathematics, not... Uh, earth-shattering, but, but fairly sophisticated. What discipline of mathematics or disciplines? Is it multidisciplinary or are we yeah, talking... It's mostly statistics. It's mostly statistics and uh, some, uh, some probability theory. And, uh, but I can't get into you know, what things we do, do use and what things we don't use. We, we reach for different things that might come, that might be effective. Uh, so we're very universal. We don't have any, any. Uh, but it's a big computer model. For one thing, there's a there is a capacity to the major model. It can manage a certain amount of money, which is rather large. But it can it can't manage an enormous amount of money because you're pushing. You're going to end up pushing the market around too much. So it's kind of a sweet spot as to how much it's reasonable to manage. Therefore. It would never grow into some behemoth, which would, uh, you know, take everybody out and you'd be the only player. I mean, well, of course, if you were the only player, there'd be no one to play against. There are, there are limitations, at least uh, the, way, the, way we, the way we see it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Unsure what time it is, but yes, started off there with <clears throat> Jim Simons. We lost a good one on Friday. Jim Simons, uncomparable to anybody in the market. Combine three uncomparable. Warren Buffett could shine his shoes. He was that good. So I'll leave off with that as we finish off the video. <clears throat> We're going into the answer week, you could call it. The answer week being... We have CPI, 
coming on Wednesday after PPI, which comes out on Tuesday. On Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, we also have Jerome Powell speaking. I've not, going back to the data, not really seen Jerome Powell be a market mover other than on FOMC days. However, we have PPI coming out prior to the open and Jerome Powell speaking after the open. So it'll be pretty indicative as to where we are headed towards being that it will be Taco Tuesday. Wednesday, we have the CPI report. And on Wednesday, we also have Fed's cash carry speaking. That's it. The week is over after that. We have the initial jobless claims, which you saw inflatedly make a move on the market there on Thursday last week. And unnecessary on Friday, OPEX Friday, this being OPEX week, we have the Eurozone CPI where Eurozone is in no way, shape or form having the inflation problems that the United States is having. A couple of headlines that are hitting here. Uh, Putin dismisses his Security Council secretary. Very interesting. Also over here, Jake Sullivan, whoever the fuck he is, speaks with Israeli's national security advisor. And U.S. Secretary of State Blinken warning Israel could fuel Hamas's rebellion in Gaza over the conflict. All of these things so that you focus your attention on them not stealing the election coming up in November. SPX. No, wrong. Start start off here with SPX. SPX, absolute, complete, and total shit week. 38, 21, 26, 34, almost 30 points on Friday. Range has totally compressed. And when you have no range, it's very very, very hard to go out there training credit spreads. And even worse, when you have no VIX, you have no VIX, you have no credit. The week, actually, you know, you could put a big asterisk on this, very similar to a prior week that we had back in November, where going back into the beginning of the month, where we had the FOMC meeting, the big shaky, shaky, shake, one, two, three, four, five, asterisk, six, seven, Green closes in a row. We do have three green weeks in a row, and that is going to be very significant moving forward if you are a data follower with PPI and CPI coming on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, Again, there with financial juice and here going on to the CPI data. One, March, March 12th. One has been a green day. I don't have the PPI data. I apologize for not having the PPI data, but I do not have the PPI data. All I have is the CPI. And on March 12th, it was because we came in line, which was increased. So anyway, here we are. We're going into the CPI and PPI on Tuesday and Wednesday. Answers will be solved. Going on to the QQQ, very same thing. Three green weeks in a row. And the two things that I want to point out about the SPX and the QQQ is the QQQ on Monday will be going into its one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It will be the ninth trading session without a minus 1% visit. Minus 1% on Monday being 437.64. Now, only during the course of this year, looking back and everybody remembering how March was the blow off, we had a string of 10, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 into April the 2nd when we had our first. And I actually had it marked down here as the April 2nd being it would be 11 trading sessions without one. And you guys remember what we did there on April 2nd, because we had that massive 5,900% trade over on the SPX. IWM, three green weeks in a row. 
an entire week spent above 200, which is very interesting. Interesting, not significant, but it is interesting. You're still getting your decent swings over here on the IWM and a minus 1% day on the IWM being that it's only a two point move, not that hard to come off. However, we never did get down below that 202. So that's going to be pretty significant to be following this week because you still have that gap going back to last week, Friday, on the close on Friday, not the jobs report gap up, but the close on Friday being there at 201.90 from back on May the 3rd. So because Thinkorswim is down, I've got to do nothing but screenshots. So I took screenshots before the market shut off and Thinkorswim wasn't accessible after 8 o'clock, I think it was on Friday night. Looking here at the futures, nothing whatsoever significant other than you are in the algorithm. And the algorithm, as you all know, as long as you are above the five-day moving average, the five-day moving average is as low as you're going to go. With everything being compressed, like I've shared as far as range goes, you are not getting below the five-day moving average on Monday. It's not going to happen. You have PPI coming to you on Tuesday. You have CPI coming to you on Wednesday. The way you break these are when you gap down below them. So on Monday, do not think that you're coming in on Monday and going to get a gangbusters range-blown day unless there is a major event that takes place, which as of this time, there isn't anything out there. Futures over on the Russell, you can see here the weak link, big drawdown, big drawdown well below before the market opened, right down to the lower Keltners, oversold on the one hour. And when you get oversold, you got no choice but to go get a bounce. So looking at it this from you, you have all the detail already as far as downside. You, you got it all. Looking here on the Dow Jones, and I'm looking at a weekly chart. Again, three green weeks in a row. Possible cell divergence setting up over on the RSI 5. Possible cell divergence setting up over on the RSI 14. Still holding above that 21 EMA on the weekly right there. Very roughly, you could call it the 50-day moving average on the daily. But nothing of any significance to really look over onto this and scream, this is undoubtedly a bullish market that we have gone into. We are done with the correction that we got. Look over onto the Dow and the weight of the Dow which yes, it does have weight. UNH always been the heaviest weight out there, but number two, number two being Goldman Sachs with Microsoft right up there with it. Caterpillar, I've gone over that. And number three, number five, Home Depot. Home Depot is going to be reporting earnings later this week. Going on to Goldman Sachs and this absolute face ripping move that it's been making since earnings came out three green weeks in a row not had anywhere that i can look back other than back here in october november where you had four weeks in a row had it over here in july where you were significantly significantly by divergence oversold boom you're on three green weeks in a row 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 three going back to three green weeks in a row, the very beginning of 2023. Is it a trade to take? Data says so. Does the chart say so? The RSI on the weekly, you can see a very clean cell divergence setup as well as a very overbought warning over there on the weekly coming over onto the daily, same thing. Looking at an overbought daily as far as your RSI 14 goes, an extremely overbought daily on your RSI 5. And once again, volume just continuing to taper off with money flow exuberantly up to the maximum 100 level. So a dip wouldn't play it. A credit spread? Very interesting. I like the way that you think. 
coming over here onto the DIA, looking at the DIA ETF. And again, as many charts as you want to throw up there that you can find yourself, your projections as to where you're at, where you're headed to, A, B, C, C equals A being right over there at 390.04. Extension above that as we broke onto it. I'm not there until the jobs, or sorry, on that Friday move on Thursday, Thursday into Friday. What was that on Thursday? I forget what it was on Thursday because I had to fly to Taiwan. So it, it is what it is. Thursday morning or very early in the morning, the big move, bang, bang, bang. And here you are up here at a very clean, don't have the wider view on this, but an AB expecting to see the C wave begin, which we will find out when CPI comes out. As we have just had our new moon, which window closed over the course of on Friday, a move down below 387 would be my confirmation where a move below 386 would start to be the big confirmation. And we would be looking there into the big gap from the jobs report from back a week ago, Friday. So that's moving on with your DIA. Looking over here on the SPX and again, looking at it from a weekly chart. Once again, very, very possible cell divergences over on the weekly. Very possible. Three green weeks in a row after having had three green weeks in a row. After coming off this euphoric move off the October lows with nine green weeks in a row and then another five after that. And again, a lot of you that are here, you remember me sharing it, looking at just last week here. Last week, all of the move came on for on Monday. Monday, that was it. The week was done. Tuesday, Wednesday, fractional, if you want to call it there on Thursday. And then Friday, your big gap up. We thought that we could get to 52.25. We got to 52.39. 52.25 plus or minus five. We made it up to 52.39 very early on Friday and right back down below that. <clears throat> Well above the five-day moving average, not even touching it there on Friday. And that five-day moving average will be moving up into the 5200s come Monday morning. 50-day moving average still sitting here just atop the big gap from the weekend, which never filled, which is above the jobs report gap, which is from last week, Friday. 5185 at the moment would be the first little alarm for the bulls. 5152 and more importantly 5142 would be a major alarm for the bulls. As of right now, the bears just got their first warning coming up here to that 5225 and it's still a bigger broader picture of everything because everything still sits very calculated and very significant as to where we're at. Nice ABC for an A, ABC for a B. Where we're at here, if we look at it from the white drawing and A, B, C, C being right up here at 52.25, we got a little bit higher than that. Look at it from a more extreme chart. One, two, there's your three, four. One, two, three, four. A, B, one, two, three, four, five. Right up to the trend line, right to the trend line, which comes off of your highs from back in the end of March and the very beginning of April, your two resistance highs after we broke above that other resistance high over here from the gap up again, as you see your two gaps that are over here the weekend and your jobs report. Looking at this from a long-term perspective, again, we had to go all the way back to 1969 when Richard Nixon's, I am not a crook, the market tanked, for a year and a half coming off of that major market tank from a year and a half 20 green weeks in a row or sorry i apologize not in a row not in a row 20 green weeks with only three red weeks only three and it was right at the same time right at the same time right at october the end of october the beginning of november right there 20 green weeks three red weeks right into april 
and then your decline, which actually took a little bit more than a year, but your bottom coming in here on the very first move down right there around June, July, that was the first major bottom. This decline, I, for, I, I don't remember the number, but the decline was somewhere in the range of 15 or 18%. And after that, your big 14 green weeks with two red weeks in a row, totally recovering where Richard Nixon, I am not a crook. Brings you to the same thing where I had it somewhere. Where are you? I know. Ah, I need to move this. I was wrong. I'm on the IWM. Let me just move the IWM to the end. All right. Bear with me. Apologize. Wasn't ready. Not really good at this. There we are with 1969 into when the Grateful Dead went and did their first concert over in England. I was born. And I bring you back to 2012. And again, with 2012 being an election year and having gone over election years, election year cycles, election years, how early part of the year, first quarter is when you tend to get that high early in the first quarter, more significantly, and then your decline going into May, going into June. 2012, exactly the same. You had your two quarters in a row, Q4 of 2011, and Q1 of 2012 were both up plus 10%. That was exactly what we wound up doing there over on the SPX as we went into the end of March. As we went into the end of March, we ended plus 10.73% year to date, first quarter of the year. As you saw there over on, where are you? 2012, we topped off on April the 2nd. We had a 15 plus percent decline into early portion of June. And then from June, your move upwards. You can see it a little bit easier as I had it here. After having a 20% decline going into that October, we didn't have a 20% decline going into that October before the big move came of that massive run into April 2, 2012. We had a dip, but we did have three red months in a row. And that was what made it easy to get long there in October at the end of it as Israel went into Gaza. But what we did was just a little bit too fucking euphoric. So in any case, we're not going to go on with comments about that. People are all bullish about these rate cuts, rate cuts, rate cuts, rate cuts, rate cuts. Well, let me bring you back for those of you that don't know what rate cuts mean. Coming off the 2002 bottom and having recovered right back to the dot-com highs over here in 2007, we had a major decline, major decline of about 13, 14%. Oh, uh, sorry, 11.91%. It's right in front of my fucking face. And then you got your first rate cut. And as that started progressing, because things were so shitty, you got your second rate cut. And then you went up there and you put a new all-time high in. You broke above the dot-com highs, plus 15% off of that decline. Because the economy today and the economy then are exactly the same. And then you got your third rate cut, and then your fourth rate cut, and then your fifth and your sixth, your seventh. I can't even put the eighth rate cut on this chart because I'm zoomed in on this. But as you already know, you were fucked. And you had a 50% decline in the market. Now, I do not see that, as I've shared with a lot of you as we've discussed. What I see going back into this, which I will zoom out, is very similar like I shared with 2012. I'm looking for a decline into June. And as we get into June, bottom out, not again, not significant drop. Then we get our bounce going into September. And sometime, some point 
in the early part of September, I see us topping out and then getting another decline as we go into the elections. Depending on what happens with the elections will depend on whether or not it's the end of the world, like 80% of forecasters are talking about right now that do Elliott Wave and quantitative analysis, or it's the beginning of the big dip that already began back in 2002, or sorry, 2022, when we topped out there in January of 2022. And yes, even though it does appear, coming back onto the chart, uh, where are you? SPX, come on, baby. I'm not really good with this when they've got it down. Even though it would appear to many that because from 48, 18, 62, and that 20 plus percent decline, and this move up here is a new bull market, sorry to say it is not. This was your A wave. This is your B wave. Big wide view. And your C wave to the downside will make most of you wish you had a passport and you used it and you went to live somewhere else because it is not going to be nice in those ocean to ocean, Pacific to the Atlantic. It is not going to be a nice place in a couple of years. So moving on from the SPX and the rate cuts over onto the NDX, which is where everything is. Everything is inside the NDX, the NDX being the index for the QQQ, which is why I say constantly, everything is inside the QQQ, everything. And if you wanted to look at this from a wider point of view, seeing as how you topped out here in 2022, come over here again and look at your rate cuts. Oh, look at that. We came back. Oh, we got a new all time high. Yeah, well, then the shit hit the fan right after that, didn't it? So on the NDX, looking over here at the weekly, and again, the reason why we took the trade off on the SPY trade going out to January 2025, even though it was only up 60%, and there was nine, 10 months left on the contract, we were oversold. And when you get oversold, it doesn't matter what your feelings are. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what you had for lunch. When you get oversold, you take the trade off and that's where it happened with us when we got that dip there down into the 416 413 area on the qqq we got oversold on the weekly on the rsi 5 not on the rsi 14 but on the rsi 5 and that was why we took the trade off and here we have three green weeks in a row moving up on the nasdaq again talking about weight microsoft apple nvidia amazon meta avgo i don't follow google the two of them now costco has brought itself up into the top 10 with tesla and netflix right there making up that little bit of move there now i am not a eyesight mathematician so i'll pull it up on screen right there for you so we can do this all together 8.67 plus 7.96 plus 6.32 plus 5.48 plus 4.69 plus 4.49 you know what? I'm going to leave that one out. 2.80 plus 2.72 plus 2.29 plus 1.92 plus 1.78. I'm going on to AMD. And where is, where is, yeah, that's about all that we'll use there, right? And we will hit the equal sign. 44.63% 4 of the QQQ is Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, Google and Goog, Tesla, Netflix, and AMD. 44% of just those stocks. And again, coming on to Costco, which only Bill is the only one that I know that trades Costco. Costco, I am watching now, and we do have a very tight range on Costco over the past couple of weeks. However, very, very overbought of, over here on Costco. And from an earnings point of view, do I have it up here? I do not believe I do. Give me a second. Downloads. Do, do, do. I do not have it up there. This week, Alibaba 
is top. Home Depot is next. And later in the week on Wednesday, we have Walmart. So obviously what happens with Walmart will take place over there with Costco. Apologize for not having that up in advance. So again, looking at Costco from a weekly point of view, extreme, or sorry, a daily point of view, extremely overbought, pending cell divergence, very similar to what we had over here in December with cell divergence, little tiny decline, 666 down to 638 very euphorically overbought as we went over here into March, as you saw, very nice 10% downside, little bit of a dip as you came down into 696. You can almost see it here, ABC. <clears throat> and what you're looking at here, again, going to the upside, ABC. We'll see how it works out as the time plays out. But again, on the weekly, overbought. Overbought once again, and now with a pending, pending cell divergence over here on your RSIs, while at the same time, money flow is starting to get a little tiny bit euphoric to go and get those $1.50 hot dogs. So I bring you on to my main center screen, bottom left. This is what I look at every single day, every single week. These eight stocks, same places, same time frames. Google, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Tesla, Amazon, Nvidia, AMD. Nobody, nobody looking amazing. And I'm looking at 15 day charts. You got your gap on Apple still to be filled. We hit that very nicely on the puts. I still see Apple filling that gap all the way down there below 174. Google, same exact thing. Google has been avoiding 160. However, at the same time, Google does have a very, very nice move and oh, I can't move my chart. It's going to try and move that very nice projection down into the mid one fifties, most likely heading down into the low one fifties on its decline over here on Tesla. I sent you out your alert there on earnings, pre earnings. If you wanted to play it, look at that one ninety three eighty one. Couldn't have hit one ninety three eighty one any better. And now you see Tesla taking an absolute shit with the earnings gap way down there below at one forty five. A lot of space to the downside to still have. Amazon, again, nothing bad to say about Amazon. Very slow mover, not really volatile. Same thing over here with AMD. I was surprised to see AMD finish the week off above 877. But who really gives a shit? They're going to be reporting earnings in two weeks. And even though it is a complete and total fucking scam, it's Enron type scam. It's going to still be there until they decide to call it a scam. They know it's a scam, but they know what would happen if they called it a scam. Microsoft, again, same thing. Volatility in Microsoft is quite nice because you've got this 415 rejection area. You've got your 400 support area. So for now, it is what it is. And then you got AMD over here, the redheaded stepchild, just getting the absolute shit beat out of it. And nobody wants anything to do with AMD. And here you are over here with everybody loving NVIDIA, 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 NVIDIA. So bring you over to the QQQ and get off of all that crap. You had a 7.46% decline. We've now had a 7.56% return, bounce. Everything looking clean, two big gaps to be filled to the downside, but we still have not filled that gap from back in the beginning of April. We've come into it. We broke above that 442.26 on Friday. That was due to be the high. We broke up above it there on Friday and we closed down below it on Friday. 442.26 is the bread and butter gravestone for your resistance over there on the QQQ. The downside, until we get that break below that 438.38 area, all we're doing is waiting. All we're doing is waiting with the 50-day moving average down here just above that gap from going over the weekend last week. And you have your big jobs report gap down to below 427. This is why, you know, if you want to take the risk and you want to look in the short term, 439 puts for CPI on Wednesday, good place to risk a little bit of money. Over there on the QQQ, looking at the Elliott wave on it. Again, same thing. Everything looks clean. A, B, C equals A at 441.58. Okay, yeah, we broke above that over here on Friday. Friday, we broke above it, came right down, closed on it. Everything looks clean. Everything looks clean on QQQ. And now all it is is awaiting some kind of confirmation. And coincidentally, the confirmation will start 
once we get below this fucking sucks line at 433.50. We start getting a little bit more confirmation on a break below 430. And as you see here over on your jobs report gap, Breaking below that 433.50 is going to put you into your jobs report gap, which finishes off there at 427. 427, you get a breakdown below and shit starts hitting the fan and it starts to accelerate very quickly for that downside move, which we're expecting, which I still see 402, maybe as much as 386. And then we bounce. So we bring you to the VIX. I would ask everybody and happy Mother's Day. I would ask their mothers to go out and have a look at the VIX. A blind mouse can go over there and look at the VIX and see 1255. Blind mouse. Last week, just nothing on the VIX. Worse and worse and worse. Every minute that went by on the VIX. And I hate to share the secret with you, but it's because we're going into OPEX next week. The number of people that were short coming in from that big drop there in April, everybody's going to get bagged on their shorts because they were selling puts or buying puts going into May 17th OPEX. And this is why your VIX is compressed. It has nothing to do with how the market temperament is because you can go over there and look at your temperature gauge which everybody shares from cnn which is oh the greatest place in the world but again coming over here and looking at it from a 30-day view we knew this was coming once we had these big moves to 2102 we came into 2102 very very early into the beginning of the month and then started hitting lower highs every drop was a lower high that was the reason why we got out of the puts, because this decline was coming. Knowing that 1339 would fail on Tuesday, didn't see that. But you did fill your gap from back here all the way in the beginning, early part of March. And here we are down at 1255. Look at it from a bigger, broader view on 1255. 1255 is your gravy stone. 1255 is sitting there screaming at you, come and buy time, buy June by September, by July, by December, by January, by fucking December of 2025 puts if you want to go out that far because you're so scared. VIX 1255, Jim Simons will tell you, dude, buy your fucking positions. You get these opportunities three, four, six times a year. So coming over here and finishing you off here with the SPX and the NDX and the Dow Jones and the Russell 2000. Looking here on the one hour charts and again, the one hour charts, how we were extremely overbought going into the beginning of the week. And we have a wider view sell divergence on the one hour charts very significantly over here on the NDX. And as you can see, your redheaded stepchild over here on the right bottom, IWM with the Russell, it's just garbage. And your big one over here on the Dow Jones. Big, big, big sell divergence on the one hour. So we come over to the four hour. Four hour on the SPX, 91.28. Four hour over here on the NDX, 85. Four hour over here on the Russell 2000, wiping your ass. And the Dow Jones, 98.74. And now you understand why I chose the June Dia puts rather than going very similar to the QQQs for July or the spies for September. I chose Dia and I chose rather than going out to the 390s, I decided to go a little bit lower to the 380s because of this powerhouse overbought four hour. So I leave you here with the Russell 2000 before I leave you off with some things to think about. The Russell 2000 looking at it from a weekly point of view and here, 196, 196, 196. Oh, look, we're above 196. Oh, we're back down below 196. And here we are trailing around that 196. Currently still supporting that 196. But we keep failing at that 207. 
197. Three green weeks in a row. Pending, pending, pending cell divergence, which was a running cell divergence already prior to the move into the downside over here in April. Pending cell divergence, but absolutely nothing other than gaps to be filled over there on the Russell 2000. Looking at it from an Elliott wave point of view, looking at it from a chart point of view. ABC, boom, perfect. C equals A, 205.67. Ah, we went to 207. Ba bam, smashed. So again, you got your earnings that are coming out here during the course of this week. Alibaba, Home Depot, Walmart. Those are your big names. Absolutely no. I would not trade any one of these prior to them reporting. Absolutely no. You want to? I'll share the chart with you. I'll share the pivots for you. Trading them before they go out there and report on their earnings? Absolutely no. So if you want it, let me know. I'll have nothing to do with it. So I will leave you off with, again, we lost a good one, man. We, we lost a good one there on Friday, Jim Simons. There is a book which I highly recommend any of you that actually want to have the freedom like I do. I can turn the internet off today. Never turn it on ever again. Every one of my baby's mamas and every one of my kids, nine kids, eight moms, every one of them's already got a million bucks. Me? I'm well set. Anyone wants that kind of freedom, I highly recommend you pick this up. The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simons Launched the Quant Revolution. And this should at least trigger you to spend five minutes a day and go over your spreadsheets. Look at new things that you could put into your spreadsheets. It's like what I said, QQQ. On Monday, this will be nine sessions without a minus 1% day. SPX on Monday will be eight sessions without a one minus 1% 1 day. SPX is an extreme, but QQQ is getting to the extreme. These are the things that you start to trigger when you've been exposed to people like Jim Simons. Maybe because you've been exposed to me, you might want to trigger and move yourself into looking at that kind of stuff. But I leave you with a couple of quotes from Jim Simons because, again, it, it is about how you handle yourself because it's your life. Don't be afraid to take risks and embrace failure. That's where the best opportunities often lie. And I will tell you, me now being an absolute addict of my garden, I'll go out there and put 50 dragon fruit cuttings. I'll have 48 of them, 49 of them all healthy brand new sprouts and the one that isn't working i'll sit there and try and figure out why isn't it working what is it that i can do to make that one have worked i'll go over there same thing with my tomatoes why are my tomatoes over here growing good but my tomatoes over here are not producing anything failures often bring you better opportunities if you look at them the right way the best decisions are often made with data and evidence, not just gut feelings, because I will tell you, gut feelings, that'll get you so far in life, and that'll get you in a lot of trouble as well, which comes on to here with luck plays a role in success, but the harder you work and the more you prepare, the luckier you get. You can't control luck, but you can control your preparation and your effort. And one of the reasons why I like to keep good people and it takes, it takes, you know, getting eight or 10 people in the room to find those one or two that, you know, are, they're just going to be there. They're, they're going to be the ones that turn the internet off and walk away because they've made it. They, they've gotten their freedom. I had a fantastic opportunity this weekend to speak with one of them on Saturday. I won't name you because I don't want everybody going over to you, but I really do appreciate when you guys take the time out to do these one-on-one -on -one calls because I can know how to answer questions when you ask them to me. And I can also get a better feel as to whether or not you're wasting your fucking time being here or this guy's really got a fucking shot. It's like being a scout. 
for baseball, you know, and finding that next, you know, Barry Bonds, that that fucking next Ohawi. It's always nice to see when your work picked up by someone else and carried on. And I can tell you, this is probably one of the greatest accomplishments that I could ever ask for, is to see when someone takes up what I have already done in my dinosauric way and you put a little bit of fizzazz on it and you were able to teach me things that I wasn't able to see on it. So I leave you off with a video from my son who moved out here a little bit more than a year ago after he lost his house over there when you had the hurricane over there in Florida. A lot for you to think about, a lot for you to consider as you still walk around on this big round ball. But let me tell you, having a smile on your face every day, every hour of the day makes a big difference. You're going to realize it one day. That happiness was never about your job or your degree or being in a relationship. Happiness was never about following in the footsteps of all of those who came before you. It was never about being like the others. One day you're going to see it, that happiness was always about the discovery, the hope, the listening to your heart, and following it wherever it chose to go. Happiness was always about being kinder to yourself. It was always about embracing the person you were becoming. One day you will understand that happiness was always about learning how to live with yourself, that your happiness was never in the hands of others. One day you'll realize that true happiness comes from within, and no external factors can define it. It was always about you. It was always about you.